Okay, it's uh, me again. Um, I'm Jean-Louis Vimbala. I want to do um, <coughs> a video on sort of a um, bit of a summary of, uh, of all my papers. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm, a, I'm really an amateur, amateur um, uh, scientist, I would say. Um, I have a number of interests. Um, oops, that disappears. Um, as you can see here, I sort of, um, you know, my job is uh, I'm a computer scientist, well, computer science project manager, basically. So I publish in these areas. Um, but in the, the area of uh, quantum physics, which I selected here, uh, I've been sort of looking um, uh, at, you know, Feynman's lectures and then more popular uh, books uh, ever since I was a, a kid. I'm 55 now. So it was like 30, 40 years, and uh, and things left me deeply unsatisfied. You know, you get a lot of models and uh, and explanations, and uh, and they all highlight like um, one particular aspect. Um, especially last 20, 30 years, you know, these uh, quark uh, hypotheses that um, is supposed to be confirmed. Um, it, it really leaves you hungry. You know, what is a color charge? Uh, the, I think the hypothesis that there is something, you know, a sort of a nuclear force that would be different than, uh, you know, the electromagnetic fields that you have inside of a nucleus because you have, you know, positive and, and uh, you know, protons and neutrons, um, you know, interacting together. Um, you know, it, it left me deeply unsatisfied. And so I stumbled upon... Um, what is now referred to as the Tita Bewegung interpretation of a uh, quantum physics, which uh, which was revived uh, by Dr. Hestenes, uh, which is a main, who is a mainstream ac academic. Uh, so I looked at this stuff, and um, yeah, for me, uh, it goes back to very uh, you know very nice work um, of uh, Schrödinger, de Broglie, de Bray, um, you know, Einstein, uh, Hendrik Anton Lorenz. And I thought, yeah, that, that that that's it. Actually, somehow after the Second World War, uh, you know, mainstream theorists, um, I don't know, got a bit confused or uh, engaged in some kind of a group think and started promoting really theoretical schemes that, um, you know, clearly are in some difficulty and get criticized because, uh, yeah, they still don't yield this this great uh, unified theory. I think the great unified theory is there, and it's based on on what I call a classical uh, electromagnetism, but then applied at, uh, you know, Planck scale. Uh, really thinking about the structure, uh, this is what surprised me, uh, you know, like in Feynman's lecture, uh, you know, why don't they think about um, the structure of, of elementary particles? So what I mean is, uh, um, you know, we measure a magnetic moment from an electron or proton, so that indicates that, you know, these are like superconducting very tiny superconducting currents that generate a magnetic moment. So we, we should be able to imagine, um, you know, whether these ring currents are um, planar oscillations or, uh, or more spherical things, or, you know, there's toroidal models of, uh, of electrons and protons around. And that's something that apparently um, mainstream physicists, uh, if you look in the literature, that left me deeply unsatisfied. Mm -hmm. you all these experiments that really measure the radius of an electron, its size, and then uh, yeah, and the theory is still that you know yeah, an electron or proton, it's like a point-like, uh, infinitesimally small charge that is uh, um, going around in space and generates a field. Said well, if you look at, if you think it has a size, it must have a structure. So what's the structure? Um, to just show where I am, um, so I thought about these things. I. I, I, I produced a blog and then about uh, in 2020 three good three years ago three and a half years ago I started publishing and these publications go well and that encourages me to to do these videos and to do uh, what is maybe the last one uh, in 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 these series uh, said so since 2020 I'm still like um, you know attracting a lot on higher than 99 percent of research gate members who first published my research interest score uh, in the field of quantum physics is now almost uh, yeah top 20 percent uh, top 20 percent of research gate members in general I like this forum and I encourage um, everyone to go on this forum uh, it has nice discussion threads much more serious than academia.edu uh, which i also tried and uh, another um, this is real research and it's kind of nice that um, 
Uh, I actually got in based on credentials as in I was an economist at some point in time uh, on publications in that field and so I could apply myself. I have 0% citations because all my papers I've never been interested in publishing them in a journal and um, so they're in a provocative style, freewheeling style. Um, people who go through my papers uh, also say, and rightly so, sometimes you oscillate between, you know, two ideas or two models, and that's true. I, I think that's um, that's the the great thing about uh, not having to worry about, you know, publishing something in a journal, not being an academic, is that you can just uh, write what you want and share your worries, and you don't necessarily need to come up with a, an academic uh, narrative in which you thank your predecessors and then add a little. Um, brick to the building they are building um so without further ado what was my last paper um da -da um here this one um uh, mystery 105 that's sort of mystery you know like physics 101 uh, a little course uh I published about 12 lectures which I think of as a physics 101 course uh, for people who are not necessarily uh you know great mathematicians or who do not necessarily well for people like me basically uh, the last one uh, the last five papers i did were like mystery papers and in there i highlighted what uh, yeah things questions big questions that for me aren't quite clear or um, you know problems um i think haven't been solved uh, even in this uh, this this pres present day in, uh, in in sort of this series of, of 50 50 plus papers um it was written in Barcelona. I had a nice week of relaxing there, but uh, I keep thinking about these things. Um, the contents uh, is, is clear. Um, today I'm going to talk about this thing, continuity and discontinuity. You know, to what extent can we apply uh, Maxwell's equations, for example, uh, at uh, the, the scale of these electron proton models, um, and, and do they make sense at that level? Um, I will also talk uh, at the end of my lecture a bit about, you know, the charge conservation principle um and what is called symmetry breaking um is it valid uh, at the smallest of scale uh, is charge conserved uh, i will argue yes we have fields and charges and fields don't somehow condense into charges charges come with fields and fields uh, you know um dictate how charge moves around and i think that doesn't uh, change when you go into the field of high energy physics that's a highly controversial um proposition but i will uh, come back to this later um to set the scene um i think my most successful paper um was this one and it's really one that um you know when people ask where should we start um, yeah, here, the Broglie's matter wave, uh, I looked at it and um, one of the nice things uh, in my exploration was that I really went back to the original writings um, and my French and German is quite uh, good, I mean, to read. Um, and there I discovered really that Louis de Broglie, de Bre, uh, sorry, it's de Bre, a bit of a Swiss pronunciation, um, <clears throat> you know, they made a bit of a mess of, uh, of his... Um, his really groundbreaking uh, hypothesis, uh, where uh, you know the brilliance of it was that he he looked at um, you know matter particles as opposed to you know photons uh, or um, you know um, well yeah it would be later discovered uh, the um, neutrinos um but photons sort of are yeah they um they are energy packets that's debatable actually they're uh they carry a field uh, and a field is not the same as energy that's a force um that becomes a force when it acts on a charge but uh, he said like um you know matter particles basically are energy packets i could call them a morceau d'énergie a piece of energy and uh, as such, uh, applying Einstein's mass energy equivalence relation, uh, the, these, these energy packets must have an equivalent mass. And so um, De Bruyne really is the pioneer of what uh, um, Wheeler would later call sort of, a, you know, mass without mass models of, uh, of matter particles. Uh, he said, really, yeah, the, now an electron and a proton is, is really a, a periodic phenomenon. 
uh, with a frequency and uh, and it's a yeah it's a piece of energy so what is energy then well what is this oscillation well it's an oscillation of charge and um, and the the important thing here to note is that uh, in his own thesis then he proceeds to um, associate a linear wave or wavelength uh, with that um, you know what he calls a matter particle as a periodic phenomenon where i thought like yeah when you think about electrons and protons as, as little ring currents then the frequency is not going to be linear but it's going to be an orbital frequency just like you know electrons spinning around a hydrogen nucleus or a, a atomic nucleus so we must think of this periodic phenomenon as a, you know something orbital and that's where um, i said haha uh, this is uh, how we should uh, indeed, you know, uh, interpret uh, Schrödinger's hypothesis later than the Zitterbewegung uh, interpretation of an electron, etc., etc. So that's the original paper, um, of which, uh, well, which I think it's about half of my research points. Um, it has, yeah, a bit more than 14,000 reads now, so that is great. Let me um, go now to the uh, topic of, of my um, little lecture here. Um, I use this, um, I will come back to this, this is a, um, so what we have is I, I have a, an electron model um, which has been uh, criticized, uh, it, it tunes um, um, Heston his own model uh, because I do explain this is something where you know I work with the concept of an, an effective mass of a, a charge spinning around a half of the energy of an electron is this uh, kinetic energy of that charge spinning around and the other half is the energy of the magnetic field that it generates that keeps uh, you know the charge in its tiny little orbit and so the um the the, the revolutionary thing uh, i think in my is that I, I really developed this very very simple straightforward presentation just using um you know like the bray um the energy mass equivalence relation e is equal to mc square uh, i use that here i use the planck einstein relation uh, energy is uh, yeah uh periodic phenomenon with a certain frequency but i said it's an orbital frequency and the um the relationship between the energy and the frequency uh, you know the ratio of the energy and that frequency is going to be that um planck's quantum of action which uh, doubles up you know its physical dimension is that of angular momentum which again underlines that uh, you know we should be thinking of these periodic phenomena an electron if it's a periodic phenomena as charge uh, orbiting around spinning around and that's where i then i have the other um uh, very simple formula is that um you know we think of these of charge elementary charge really as having no rest mass the rest mass of an electron and a proton comes from a massless uh, point like charge um which explains the anomaly and the magnetic moment. I, uh, I put it in my paper, so I will, uh, I will go over them very quickly. But uh, if you think of that, yes, something that has an orbital velocity, uh, which is equal to the speed of light, um, which orbits around at a certain radius, um, at a certain distance from uh, its geometric center A, uh, at a certain orbital frequency, well, this frequency and that frequency uh, should be the same frequency, and that's where you get then you know, A divided by C, uh, that frequency, uh, and that frequency E divided by, um, sorry, H bar divided by E, um, should be equal to each other. And from there you get, um, you, then you substitute the energy for the mass of the electron, which I said is two times the effective mass of that charge uh, as it spins around. That's the basic difference with um, the formulas from Dr. Hestenis. Who, who comes with a radius which is uh, two times the uh, experimentally measured radius uh, from from photon scattering experiments uh, quantum scattering um but so i get my radius you can um stop the video and go a bit slower but you get an electron radius uh, which as we know is much larger than the proton radius 386 femtometer or 0 0.386 picometer um and then the second breakthrough, uh, which got me a lot of reads, I think, is then, uh, you know, a few years ago, um, more precise measurements were were made uh, by Jefferson Lab, the 
P rat uh, uh, experiment, proton radius and the Pratt uh, P rat yeah, um, proton radius, um, which came with this measurement 0 0.841 uh, femtometer, which was a bit off previous experiments, basically because they used another um, methodology, uh, um, another uh, scattering. Uh, I have, a few years ago, I would um, give you the details of that, but um, it's, it's one of the paper. In any case, they uh, they came with that radius, and I immediately saw that. So that's four times um, this uh, nuclear uh, distance or active radius that uh, uh, Yukawa used for his nuclear potential, uh, exactly four times. And so, um, yeah, I said, okay, so the radius is uh, four times uh, this Yukawa uh uh, range of nuclear forms h divided by mc which is the same formula as um yeah but we have a different mass factor now we have the proton mass factor so how wh what's this for then huh? how can we explain that and that i turned upside down and thought about it a lot and um, i think two or three papers uh, really um differ from each other because that factor four must somehow be in these equations huh? uh where do we put that factor four, or do we divide it over um, the, these various equations? In the end, uh, I think this one is the most logical because the Planck Einstein relationship is indeed energy is uh, h bar times the frequency. But as we know from Bohr orbitals and many other periodic phenomena, uh, Planck Einstein relation is uh, in its most general expression the energy is uh, an integer times uh, h times. Um, omega that frequency and so why is that factor four i broke my head over it and in the end i think it's just um, what many people are what do you mean by a form factor well with a form factor is uh, what i mean is uh, an electron seems to be like a planar oscillation oscillation in one plane and um, for the proton model i have a very simple uh, spherical model it spins round and round and round but it oscillates in uh, two planes um so that's the form factor, and then maybe we have, uh, you know, um, transients or temporary, uh, um, like muon electrons, uh, uh, larger things that combine and have a factor in between the one and the four. Uh, we can we can discuss that, uh, but I'm not going to do that here. I want to talk about stable particles. And so for me, that form factor is the same as the formula, the four factor that you have when you calculate the surface of a sphere as opposed to the, uh, you know, the area of a, of a circle, pr square, this is four uh, pr square. Uh, or is the same thing like when you calculate the, the, the moment of inertia, the angular mass of a solid disk uh, versus, um, you know, a hoop or a point-like charge is going around. Um, then you also have that factor four and it has to do with, you know, geometric shape, spherical shape. Or uh, you know a solid uh, um, disc as opposed to a hoop. So that factor four also comes in. You know when uh, this, the, what they call the Gaussian four factor uh, when you analyze uh, spherical waves instead of planar waves, uh, or um, you know things that um, like you know an electric potential um, from a point-like charge. You will also have that four uh, p factor. Uh, uh, times the electric constant and then you know as we know uh, there's um, an inverse uh, proportionality with the distance r so um, I think that doesn't need much explaining um, we're still uh, I'm very grateful to a few people um, I still don't know what the final proton model is going to be like the electron model I say it should be you know plain planar uh, ring current, but you still have toroidal models. Um, uh, Oliver Konsa has one, the Prion model, as he calls it. The proton model of um, someone who encouraged me very much to, to think for myself is Giorgio Vasallo. He also thinks, you know, it's not a spherical thing, uh, but more like a toroidal thing where we have uh, two frequencies, not one. I think there's only one frequency, and that's the main argument I use to think, like, you know, it must be something spherical. Um, <clears throat> Am I going to dig further into that, prove it? Uh, yes and no. I will talk about that. So I sent this to um, first the pre-rat uh, research group and then to uh, you know a number of other rather eminent 
um, academics and they did reply uh, and I'm very grateful for that but they also at the same time said well your model looks very much like um, you know it's a bit of numerology it's not complicated enough um, and then they raised also the usual questions that we have with these reincarnate models why don't they radiate their energy out and this is something that has puzzled me because um, you know my models are called numero numerology uh, Feynman has a model to, in which he calculates the, the size of an atom and um, you know basically that's uh, as numerological, numerological uh, as my model I say where um, you know I refer here he couches in a lot more um, you know he talks about he takes actually a non-relativistic formula for the kinetic energy of an electron in an orbit around uh, a proton which is the hydrogen the very simple hydrogen atom model um, of which he wants to calculate you know he wants to calculate the Bohr radius uh, this, this this classical um, third radius of um, of an electron uh, we know uh, there's the the Compton radius, maybe I should say that, nobody heard of the Compton radius, one thing I'm very proud of, I thought it was a very natural concept. Um, but if you Google that, the Compton radius, you will see my blog, so I, apparently everybody thinks about a Compton scattering, you know, Compton wavelength, uh, a linear thing, and I'm, yeah, uh, I think that's why my um, my stats, uh, research stats as an amateur are rather good. Uh, I coined apparently the term Compton radius rather than wavelength because I think of the size of an electron as a, you know, indeed something that um, is uh, like a circle, like something that goes in an orbit. It has nothing to do with a, a linear wavelength. Um, and that's how I explain Compton scattering in some of my papers also. So, um, but to come back to this, so uh, Feynman has also a very numerological model, and uh, you know, it's uh, as I said he he starts with a, a kinetic energy definition uh, one over two mv square, which is uh, relativistically not correct. Um, so I simplify his argument here. The relativistically correct uh, definition of kinetic energy is. Um, the relativistic linear momentum um, of that charge, uh, uh, in this case, uh, the electron itself, which has a structure, but so he, he looks at a larger level, p square divided by m. So we have mv square divided by m, and um, yeah, then we have a factor two, which has nothing to do with the uh, uh, non-relativistic definition of kinetic energy, but which is the factor two, which appears here in my effective mass definition. So this one is relativistically correct, and so I think I improve on Feynman's calculation of the size of an atom there. And then we have this, uh, well, it's basically a rewriting of uh, the Heisenberg's um, uncertainty relation i would say but as a certainty relation that uh, you know a p the linear momentum times uh, a distance uh, you can think of delta p uh, times delta x uh, that's how it's written the uncertainty principle um but yeah the momentum as yeah, a certainty principle i would say uh, the momentum multiplied by this distance uh, this radius a should be equal to h bar and um, and from there um, you can indeed then uh, do what uh, what Feynman does. Uh, the kinetic energy is this uh, when we substitute this in this. Um, then we have a formula. Uh, the energy equipartition theorem says that half of the energy should indeed be kinetic, and the other half should be. Um, is potential energy huh? so um, why the minus um, because you know when an electron circles around a proton uh, to combine and form an, an, an hydrogen atom then it's going to lower its energy as compared to the uh, uh, electron and the proton existing separately you know at some infinite distance or far away distance uh, in free space as we call it um, so that's why the energy is negative and um, the e square here is written it's uh, you know is a classical electron charge uh, simplifies calculations but it's really you know the charge of the electron expressed in coulomb uh, divided by four pi and uh, this gaussian factor again um, with the electric constant and so we um, how do we then calculate the radius we optimize we say uh, indeed uh, the electron orbiting around 
a proton is going to minimize its energy, kinetic and potential taken together. So, um, yeah, the, the minimax rule says that you just take the derivative uh, of the energy then uh, with respect to that uh, variable uh, that we want to calculate. That should be equal to zero. And so that we take the derivatives of these two parts and we arrive, medical, medical, uh, at exactly the experimentally measured radius of a hydrogen atom, which is 53 uh, picometer, so a lot larger. An electron has really three uh, radius. Uh, this is this Bohr radius, and then of course larger radii. When um, the electron goes in an excited state, its own um, radius, I would say, that explains the Compton radius, Compton scattering. And then there's this point-like charge inside, which is orbiting around, which we think of as having uh, some kind of a very small size, and that explains, um, as I write in my papers, the anomaly. And maybe I'll quickly show that paper uh, just to guide you around. The um, if I have it open. Yeah, in the structure of electrons, protons, and atoms, I bring all these formulas together, and um, you can go through that paper, and I also explain uh, anomalies and why for a proton we need to use that uh, energy as n time h. I explain a lot of stuff, the structure of an atom, going back to the original Bohr model, um, etc., etc., and somewhere... I talk about geromagnetic ratios, explain them in uh, everyday terms. Um, and I also talk about um, the anomaly in a magnetic moment, because if we think of uh, that point like charge inside of an electron uh, having some definite size, uh, which is given by the uh, fine structure constant, then, um, you know, yeah, there's a... Um, the anomaly in the magnetic moment is not a an anomaly at all. It's just a normal, a very normal thing. Is this perfect? Is this great? Uh, does this solve all questions? Probably not. Uh, and I, I put a list here of, um, you know, questions that are unanswered. What remains to be done? Uh, I will come back to that. But I just want to say, like, you know, this numerological model of Feynman, nobody calls that numerology, uh, because it's Feynman who wrote it back in, uh, you know, the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. And, uh, yeah, and I would also say, like, uh, you know, Feynman's analysis of superconductivity, uh, have a look at it, it's the last chapter. Um, yeah, that's a bit numerological as well, you know, he doesn't, uh, because that's the criticism you know, these simple models uh, somehow don't integrate um, Maxwell's equations or don't take them into account. And, uh, um, yeah, this mystery of why, um, you know, if we have an orbiting charge, there is no energy being radiated out. Um, that's the main criticism of these models. And I'm going to show now uh, why I think that criticism is not valid. And here I'm going to um, not spend too much time but I need to go through the motions to um, to explain. We have, um, and this is the, the thing, continuity and discontinuity. Uh, in a few of my papers I write, you know, Maxwell's equations, um, they work with the charge densities and currents. So, uh, you know, to talk about densities, uh, charge or, or, or current densities, um, you know, you, um, yeah, that the Maxwell's equations cannot apply to really to like a, a small point like charge. Uh, which it would be in some orbit, like we think it is in a proton or a neutron. I must take these words back, um, and I knew that a little bit when, when I said that, because, you know, when you take Maxwell's equations, um, you can rewrite them as we do them here in terms of... Um, you know, the scalar and the vector potential, I'm not going to explain too much uh, what they are, uh, but they're sort of, um, you know, we can think in terms of the electric field vectors and the magnetic field vectors, uh, but then we have, um, you know, an x, y, z, and t coordinate for the electric one, and an x, y, z, t for the um, uh, magnetic one. The scalar and, um, oh, I would call it the magnetic potential, but it's the four, uh, it's the... The, the vector potential, when you combine them in a four vector, you get a, a, a math that is much nicer. And you can always go back to your more visual or conceptually easier to understand interpretation in terms of electric and magnetic field vectors by um, differentiating. Uh, as I write here, you can always get the magnetic field vector from um, taking the... Um, 
the curl of the of the uh, 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 vector potential and you can get your electric field from a much more complicated uh, thing i want to um, take the opportunity here to explain quickly what a gate is um, when we sort of rewrite uh, Maxwell's equations to arrive at this which is exactly the same thing um, we are introducing indeed this this vector field this new vector field uh, the, the the vector potential and um, and that implies sort of that we uh, you know need to establish a condition or a relation or make a choice that relates uh, that vector um, field to um, let me take another color going to be maybe nicer this color um to the scalar potential so we need to establish some kind of relation some kind of condition and that's what's meant by choosing uh, the gauge for uh, in electromagnetic theory it's a very straightforward gauge it's called the lorentz gauge and lorentz is not hendrik anton lorentz um but it's with a t uh, it was a, a danish scientist in the 19th century who saw that and helped uh, you know arrive at this more abstract but simpler because we only have two equations um expression of maxwell's equations now the point is um oof, that looks very complicated uh, and uh, you know in very specific situations um you know you know solution must come out of it and it's solution for the scalar potential and uh, as you can see it here we have a laplacian uh, uh, acting on the um, scalar and the vector potential respectively and then we have uh, the second order time derivative acting on the same and that really resembles you know the general three-dimensional wave equation we would have um, or that we see uh, when we talk about how waves uh, propagate um, the functional shape of such wave um, well, that depends on the physical situation. We can have plane waves, spherical waves, uh, and I put formulas here. So these functional forms depend really on, well, the actual uh, sources, uh, the charges at the origin that get or got these waves uh, started. Uh, and so then, um, um, yeah, you have specific solutions, but there's also this grand general solution which uh, i refer to Feynman for a derivation really very interesting and you should be aware of it for any charge distribution you know so we have a charge somewhere at a point xyz in space at some point t yeah, because it could be dynamic and change we have a current uh, going through point xyz at some point t the current may, may also change at some point one and at some point t now the remarkable thing is that uh, in these uh, generalized solutions um it's 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 a mathematical beast is that we have we must take the retarded time uh which is the time it takes is actually for an effect or a field to travel from point one to point two and so we uh the time interval is given by the distance divided by the velocity which is c and then we make this integral all over space uh, around that point one where we want to measure uh, or calculate the scalar and vector potential and so there we are um, so we have lots of integrals and then we have only calculated you know the scalar and vector potential at one specific point in space and in time so you can imagine uh, yeah you would need supercomputers um, to calculate anything meaningful in a real life situation which can be very complex with charges everywhere and currents uh, going from here and there uh, and moving charges so the uh, the interesting thing is um, this general solution is is not very useful uh, to uh, approach what we are talking about what um, if we have a single uh, moving charge hmm? uh, like we have in our electron and proton models uh, we think of a point like charge uh, not infinitesimally small it has some tiny little size uh, uh, given by a defined structure constant the ratio uh, or applied to the uh, uh, that 386 um, picometer um, sorry femtometer um so that's what uh Feynman then also does he said okay let's let's um let's take the simplified situation where we have only one charge and uh and let's calculate uh, that charge is a uh, uh, let's calculate at at some point in space uh, we call that point one at some point in t what um scalar and vector potential that we have and i said you know if we want to calculate the electric and and uh, magnetic field vectors we can easily do that by um you know differentiation 
So then he arrives at this formula, Q, uh, the charge, which we have somewhere, uh, moving around, and um, 4P, uh, the Gaussian factor, times the electric constant. Here we have the reverse of the magnetic constant, uh, because we know a magnetic electric constant are related, uh, 1 over um, the product of the magnetic and electric uh, constant uh, is equal to c square, so we can write them in terms of each other. And we have indeed sort of uh, r minus uh, the velocity of that charge times the distance from um, the point where we are measuring that point one divided by c. So we have a retarded uh, time here, and this is actually what we what we do is um, we have a retarded time, but actually all of these variables. Uh, Feynman shows that very beautiful. Uh, the velocity must also be uh, measured uh, at a point in time which is the retarded time because effects need, electromagnetic effects need some time to travel through space to the point where we are measuring uh, their effect. Now, the interesting thing, and this is the one where, um, you know, these simple models electron moles get criticized is that you get um you know you can rewrite it and the Feynman himself does not recommend to try to uh, recalculate the result but he tells you how to do it he says he basically rederived his result but later discovered that actually Oliver Heaviside famous uh, mathematical physicist uh, had already derived in 1902 he arrives for um you know the electric field and the beta field which did mechanically depends on the, on the electric field. Um, you know, this formula where we have, uh, I'm not going to explain it, it's very interesting, I give the reference here, uh, chapter 2, sorry, chapter 18 in volume 2 of his lecture, plus um, chapter 21. Uh, I, will, I will show them in a moment, so uh, don't worry about it. But you have um, two effects, um, waves uh, that are created electromagnetic uh, waves by a moving charge and they fall off very quickly uh, as the square of the distance the radiation term and this is the interesting one and why uh, i'm going to talk about it uh, a moving charge uh, that accelerates uh, we have the second order derivative so uh, there needs to be an acceleration of charge a uniformly you know a charge moving at a uniform speed will not generate um, this term because the, the second order derivative um, is zero but when we have accelerating charge uh, as we have for instance when we uh, when radio waves are generated then um, yeah that's going to obey this law of radiation and the the thing is, uh, this formula is mathematically correct. And uh, you know, for instance, example in synchrotron radiation, we have a similar situation where you know charges electrons or protons are being accelerated by enormous energies and go around and around uh, in, in a cyclotron or a synchrotron uh, in these accelerators, and they go around and around. And so there's a centripetal acceleration, and uh, yeah, um, there is synchrotron radiation. Uh, Sherenkov radiation and Feynman shows that in another chapter that you know this law of radiation really can be observed uh, and is confirmed by many many experiments and we don't need to confirm it by you know experiments like measuring the synchrotron radiation but yeah that's how radio waves work that's how an antenna radio antenna emits uh, electromagnetic waves and so they say this law is why, uh, you know, elementary ring currents cannot exist. Um, and But it's also this miracle, like, you know, an electron orbiting around a proton and a, and a hydrogen atom should uh, radiate out, um, should emit radiation. And so it should, uh, when it emits radiation, then it sort of should spiral onto the proton because, yeah, it loses its energy. Now, now I'm going to show the... Um, um, the chapter itself, where do I have it? No, that's his uh, size of an atom. Here, um, you really need to go into the details of, um, you know, this 
how this general solution, uh, this Lienard and, and Richard, uh, Lienard was a Frenchman and Richard was a, uh, a German uh, physicist, and they discovered these equations independently. They analyze a point charge, um, not as you know our electron, you know a, a, a thing uh, that has a point charge inside, and then they don't analyze electrons and protons as. Um, as uh, you know, ring currents. No, they they think of it as some kind of uh, point charge that is not infinitesimally small. Indeed, this is a surprising thing. Always, you know, all these equations don't think of point charges as infinitesimally small. No, they think of them as, of them as being very very small, very tiny. And they don't specify the size, but a point charge must have some. Uh, charge distribution uh, and um, all these things and the derivations are based on the fact that there's a yeah i can't draw on this thing because uh, i have the um google chrome open here but you look at this block of charge or this you know it can be square it makes the calculation easier or, or round and that's where they send and then uh, use um you know um differential logic i would say they cut it up in very small bits and pieces uh, um, as you can see here, and um, yeah, with, with very small and fantastically small volume elements, and then they, you know, add them. Um, there's a sum, a summation sign here, an Einsteinian a summation sign, but yeah, that gets then, uh, of course, uh, that becomes an integral, and etc. etc. But you need to look at this thing, and so yeah, we integrate and we arrive at these calculations for indeed a moving point charge, but it's not. You know, this is not an electron. This is not how an electron or a proton looks like in our model of um, a ring current. And so that is where uh, I tell my critics is that, uh, you know, we cannot apply uh, these uh, uh, lienard richard solutions for a single uh, point charge that is uh, moving in some kind of, a, uh, you know, at a non-uniform speed or uh, in 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 in. in uh, in a circular loop um, because um, yeah this kind of derivation doesn't apply our electron has a structure and the proton has a structure and it's not a, a uniform uh, charge uh, density um, you know a sphere of charge or uh, a disk of charge no it's something different and that's where these uh, uh, quantum um, quantum equations are the Planck Einstein relationship and uh, Einstein's mass energy, they can be applied directly and there's no contradiction. These models are fully consistent, as what I write here also with uh, Feynman's analysis of superconductivity and his own theory, or would say his own theoretical derivation of the size of an atom, which he downplays and says, you know, this is a kind of a, a heuristic model of an atom only. I'm going like, no, it's not heuristic, it's precise and uh, and it's fine. So um, I've been rambling a bit, and I'm going to take a small um, uh, break, maybe, to look at what else I wanted to show you. Um, this We talked about that, these electron, that's the paper uh, I refer to you. The, I'm going to come back to um, charge conservation in a moment. Maybe I should uh, do that now. The other things are um, kind of obvious, I think. Yeah. Okay, I've covered that. So the um, what remains to be done recently? I got some uh, interesting suggestions, and um, you know, people do mail me and contact me on ResearchGate and say, "Oh, look at my model. Look at this. Look at that." Uh, I'm gonna clearly um, uh, uh, tell you what my interest is, and that uh, also immediately add. I have very limited time, and I really actually wanna wanna stop doing this kind of research because it does drive you nuts after a while. And I see a lot of people going a little bit nuts. I think uh, what remains to be done, and this is still very interesting, is um, in my um, worldview, uh, so in this uh, non-mainstream realistic interpretation of uh, quantum physics, uh, so I have um, two kinds of particles. Uh, I don't call them bosons and fermions, but I have these stable, stable matter particles, electrons and protons, and their antimatter counterparts. 
plus also, and this is interesting, I have a neutron model, um, which uh, I can't solve analytically, but for me, neutron is some kind of combination of positive and negative charge, and I analyze that. Uh, a neutron is very special, it's stable inside of the nucleus, and that's where I'm going, like, you know, the neutron, uh, it's not gluons that uh, glue uh, quarks together, no, it's neutrons, um, if you look at a nuclei, uh, the first the helium nucleus, that's two protons, and you have two nucle uh, neutrons. And these neutrons act a bit as the glue. And how do they do that? Well, they must, and this is something I haven't done yet, is sort of, you know, conclusive neutron model, uh, which is kind of normal. I said my proton model, uh, I'm still, uh, well, I'm not oscillating. I think my spherical model makes more sense than a toroidal model. Um, even if the, Dr. Giorgio Vassallo uh, tries to convince me of the opposite. Um, I only see one frequency. Uh, the Bruys uh, frequency of a proton is the Bruys frequency of a proton, and it's related to its mass, and that's where all the other um, variables come out of very easily. And uh, also the magnetic moment, which I calculate. Um, proton is too small to sort of have a very precise manage measurement of the an anomaly. I think that will come in 10, 20 years. Um, people will measure or comp perceive of some kind of anomaly and uh, that's going to be interesting but um yeah this analysis of stable martic particles versus all these uh transients and uh, particle zoo um i wouldn't a neutron has a fairly long lifetime and i said it's stable inside the nucleus so i wouldn't call that a transient but at the same time it's an unstable particle um in free space but there's so many um other non-stable particles and that's an analysis uh, in high energy physics where and that I write here um, you know should probably be worked out in some kind of a new S matrix program it's poor uh, matrix where you do write a wave function I do that for an electron and a proton so I do represent them by a wave function and the wave function just represents the motion uh, as Dirac puts it you know what is a what is a good representation of um, you know particles so, well it's a wave function representation but you know what he talks about really is the equations of motion of charge that's what should be modeled uh, he wrote that in 1932 and he repeated that in 1956 at the last edition of his principles of quantum mechanics so uh, yeah some kind of new s matrix when you have these functions and you go from one um group of uh, stable particles uh, you smash them all together and then you know some kind of new equilibrium appears uh, in between you have all these unstable particles that merge and um, disintegrate into more stable components yeah that's an analysis uh, that probably needs to be redone to make sense of the particle zoo which had which has only become bigger and bigger. Uh, an analysis of nuclei, I said I don't have uh, the equations of motion for the positive and negative charge in a neutron, and I don't exactly know how they act as a, as a glue, but I have one paper, uh, I'm not going to show it, uh, or maybe I should. Um, let me go to my profile. The research... Yeah, the proton yarn ball puzzle I talk about this is the proton model where I talk about all these models that are around and apparently nobody makes a choice. Uh, my choice is made. Um, lamp shift in classical terms. Where, uh, here on the proton radius, nuclear oscillations and the nature of uh, neutrinos. That's where I explore uh, a, a different kind of um, model uh, that we should apply to explain why this or that nucleus consists of two protons and two neutrons or three protons and two neutrons and where all these isotopes come from. Um, yeah, that there's a lot of stuff to be done in that area. Um, I'm sure I am not going to do it. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, let me talk to the, the, the main second topic now, the charge conservation law uh, in the context of uh, high energy physics. And here I'm going to go back to my uh, paper. I hope I still, the metaphysics of physics. Uh, I, I, I recommend reading it, so I'm going to read it a bit. The realistic interpretation of quantum physics that we have been pursuing is based on this dichotomy. Yeah? We have fields and charges, and matter particles carry charge, while field particles and photons and neutrinos do not. 
Um, we argued as convincingly as we could, but it is and remains a minority point of view within what is already a non-mainstream interpretation of quantum physics, that charge must somehow be conserved always. Um, I refer to a paper I did that, you know, uh, most particle reactions that involve uh, matter-antimatter uh, pair creation or annihilation take place at a nucleus. Or they involve transient particles such as pions. The pions are rather heavy and, you know, are either neutral or charged, plus or minus. Uh, but even the neutral pions, we think there's positive and negative charge inside of them. So the um, when when positive and negative charge annihilate each other, we think uh, it is kind of a nuclear uh, reaction. We analyze uh, matter-antimatter uh, pair creation and annihilation as basically... Um, you know, a, a nuclear process. And uh, coincidentally, I, I didn't think too much of that, but I actually going to show, um, going back to the publications, it is actually my second most read um, publication. And so people who would like to dig further into that, um, well, I welcome them. And these are questions I would entertain if you have sort of doubts on my model. Um, I will talk about the anti-dark matter uh, in a moment. Um, where do I have it? Nuclear force and neutron. I said you can uh, analyze everything in terms of a, a deuteron model I tried to make. Um, electron propagation. I rewrote a number of lectures. Um, field, where, where is that paper? I don't see it. Um, where would it be? I do have a paper on, uh, you know, charge and, um, charge pair uh, creation and annihilation as a nuclear process and I don't see it here nuclear force quaternion math a number of interesting things it's kind of weird ah here it is Pair production as a nuclear process. So this is actually most of the natural processes that go on as cosmic rays, uh, you know, hit um, an oxygen, uh, oxygen or, or, uh, or nitrogen in the air, uh, which are molecules. Then, um, you know, yes, there's, um, here's the figure uh, that I think uh, a shower of um, transient particles and pions, and then they disintegrate, it is integrated into... Um, well, gamma rays were supposed to be photons, but these then integrate into electron and uh, positron pairs. And um, and this is where I'm thinking, and I'm going to come back to that, that these um, photon rays, uh, sorry, gamma rays, uh, may not be really real um, photons. Uh, they're not pure electromagnetic radiation, pure uh, light. They actually carry charge, and they are neutral, just like neutrons. Uh, neutral because they combine positive and negative charge. That's my hypothesis that there is sloppy accounting there, uh, that, you know, a combination of positive or negative charge in a neutral pion or in these gamma rays, uh, you know, um, sorry, in these yeah, the gamma rays, uh, are, are somewhere um, not, not, not being accounted for. Um, I do not see why it would not be true. Uh, it's a hypothesis you cannot prove, but it's also a hypothesis you cannot uh, disprove. Uh, here we have this shower. So uh, these natural processes uh, where you see pair uh, production and um, matter-antimatter uh, annihilation, they, uh, most of these experiments involve the presence of a nucleus and the only role in mainstream theory of the nucleus is to absorb the excess kinetic energy uh, 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 the energy that, that uh, they can't account for, well, that's the kinetic energy of the nucleus who gets some linear motion then. Uh, I don't agree with that. The role of the nucleus must be far more important because otherwise, um, you know, why would these uh, gamma rays or these pions 
only disintegrate uh, or uh, recombine in uh, matter and antimatter parts near the nucleus. The nucleus must play a much uh, much more important role than uh, you know what mainstream theory says. So that's fair enough. And for me, something easy. Again, uh, hypothesis, you cannot prove it. But I think the charge conservation law holds there. A more difficult thing is, um, you know, these more recent experiments. Well, recent, they, were the, they started in the 70s, where you have sort of, um, you know, electron beams and um, uh, laser beams combining. And they say, well, there's no nucleus present there. And that's where I wrote um, a second paper, a mystery paper. Galgo goes into um, detail on that, on these kind of processes. And I uh, argue the same thing. Charge just, um, you know, it just, it, it doesn't vanish. Um, and I feel that I'm in rather good company because there actually, there was a science news article in 2021 who commented on these articles. And um, and someone said there, indeed, you know, these photons that are used in these experiments, uh, they are like, well... Virtual photons, they they surely aren't real photons. They have some rest mass, and I'm thinking, yes, if they have some rest mass, then it means they must be carrying a charge. So that means they aren't real photons. And then you know you can argue, uh, and this is what I uh, write in the paper. Um, here, um, can matter be created out of light? Yeah, there was a, there are actually two papers on that. And I refer to discussion thread on rich on research gate. Um, yeah, it raises the question, of course. Like, uh, okay, I'm I'm comfortable with my minority point of view because you know Stuart Mangles is a rather famous uh, plasma uh, nuclear scientist. He said, well, unlike normal photons which have no mass, these photons in the um, these highly energetic photons in the experiments do have mass. So if they have mass, then for me it's the Bray's uh, hypothesis. They must have. Uh, they must carry charge, and that charge may not appear uh, immediately because uh, it's like a neutron. They carry uh, a pair, uh, positive and negative charge. So I'm comfortable with my minority point of view. Um, however, during that break in Barcelona, I said, yeah, if these highly energetic photons in these experiments are not real photons, because as suggested by the likes of Mangles, they do seem to have some uh, uh, rest mass, uh, tiny or not, uh, depends on uh, you know what the, what their velocity is, the energy they absorb. It's kind of difficult um, to to establish their rest mass. Then then what are they? Um, and the other question I have at the macro scale is: you, we know now this is a very interesting last decade or something since 2015. Uh, the reality of gravitational waves really confirms that you know in the universe there is this mass destruction going on. Literally mass destruction in every sense of the world when for instance two black holes swallow each other um, so that has been well established and mass just disappeared there so what about charge conservation there uh, what happens and uh, i write it i have no answer to that but still i stick to my hypothesis that you know these virtual photons in the above uh, experiments and the um, you know the particles that must somehow account for all these charges that disappear maybe they behave like these um, I, I refuse to call them bosons z0 particles that were um, confirmed experimentally uh, then it's all about interpretation eh? uh, back in 1973 um, which confirmed I think the theory of Sheldon Lee Glasgow Weinberg and Abdus Salam they got a Nobel Prize for it on neutral current neutral currents are uh, you know a wire with a nuclei uh, uh, positively charged nuclei and electrons then hopping from electron shell that's um, in a whole a neutral object and so neutral current you know it's nothing new um, but what would be new is that we have these rather heavy Particles. I said I refuse to call them bosons because there's no proof whatsoever that the, um, you know, that you can just pile them on top of each other like you can pile photons uh, on top of each other um, while they keep their integrity. But that these Z0 um, particles uh, would be these uh, mysterious neutral particles that would account for these charges that are supposed to disappear. So they don't disappear. And if you look at the disintegration processes of uh, uh, Z, uh, uh, neutral Z 
bosons, is the intermediate vectors, uh, let's call them that way. Uh, they do integrate into uh, pairs again, pairs of charge. So I'm thinking like they, um, a charge does not uh, disappear and then reappear at some other uh, point in space. In between, you have uh, indeed neutral transients carrying them from point A to B. Uh, that's my hypothesis. I make it makes sense ontologically, philosophically, logically, but um, but yeah, I'm rather alone with that point of view. Um, I said it. Is there evidence for that? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. But for me, it could be uh, explained in these terms. So um, second point, continue. We talked about that. Uh, let me go back to the other things. Um, that I think I were talking about, and also when when you know people who listen to me and would write me and say, "Oh, what about this? What about that?" Uh, I I still think, despite what I said, that uh, you know these um, laws of radiation, these uh, really um, macro um, the Leonard and the Richard potentials and all that, I said they don't apply uh, because their analysis is based on the concept of a point-like charge as some kind of continuous distribution of of, uh, of even smaller uh, bits of charge. Um, they don't apply, but it would be interesting still, uh, and this is what I uh, where I'm going to end my presentation, um, to kind of look at, um, you know, yeah, how would Maxwell's equations... Um, how should we write them when we are looking at these uh, superconducting uh, loops of current? Uh, they're not superconducting loops of current like um, the Cooper pairs that you have. No, but really at that level, just one point like charge going around and around uh, according to these um, uh, laws here, the simple uh, laws of quantum physics. Maybe, um, maybe there are equations that don't result in um you know what we have here that they should radiate their energy away um maybe not i hope so um i see and that's where also i'm quite comfortable and i don't want to engage because the maths are you know, very advanced carlos um dos santos am dos santos somebody who wrote me who st started publishing um on research gate uh, i don't know who he is and whatever but his uh, scores are going up rapidly because indeed he writes about uh, the these schwinger limits eh? schwinger you know after the second world war um he had a lot of arguments with uh, richard feynman um but they both got a nobel prize uh, for a bit opposite theories in terms of uh, you know is local charge conservation or propagation uh, or um, is it more like this path integral uh, stuff that we should apply when analyzing um, you know, amplitudes or interpreting them? Uh, in any case, he wrote about the Schwinger limits, and Schwinger limits, as far as I understand it, yeah, indeed sort of theoretical limits, um, you know, very small scales uh, where uh, Maxwell's equations uh, break down. Um, if they break down, yeah, maybe, maybe they don't break down. Maybe we just need a reformulation, as said, in, in some kind of other uh, analysis uh, than, um, you know, what is used. Uh, let me go back to um, Feynman's thing here. You know, this kind of stuff where uh, we think of a point-like charge, an electron or a proton or whatever uh, carries charge as a uniform uh, block or square or um, sphere uh, of charge. It's not uniform. Uh, they have a structure, and um, the math to um, to model that kind of thing would be very complicated, though, because you're actually combining Maxwell's equation with sort of, um, yeah, a system, uh, yeah, and then a, ch a charge system itself. And so I don't know if there's any math that can do that a few months ago i did get contacted by an iranian a mathematician who who has said uh, you should look at uh, discrete analysis uh, there apparently are mathematical models around that might do the trick um but i don't know um but that would be interesting because it would finally you know uh, make all critics critics uh who tells who says these things are like uh, you know numerologically and uh, numerological um developments only uh yeah they may make them shut up i think um interesting would also be to have like a better theory of interaction between a light like particles let's think of photons that or neutrinos and neutrinos combining with uh, because neutrinos i also see them as a three-dimensional uh electromagnetic oscillation photons as a two-dimensional oscillation so that's why photons interact with electrons and neutrinos with protons so these uh, electrons and protons and their antimatter counterpart have um you know, light-like 
particle counterparts, I would say. And so, but yeah, how does Compton scattering work exactly? Do we have a photon that uh, gets absorbed temporarily um, by this uh, electron system, uh, as I would call it, yeah, this ring current? Uh, the um, electromagnetic field of a photon then sort of gets absorbed, and after a while, you know, um, a new photon gets um, spit out uh, with a different frequency and the difference uh, goes into the kinetic energy of the electron as a whole. Um, that's sort of my theory of it, but it's a verbal theory. Uh, the math of that would need to be uh, worked out. And that's sort of um, where I got stuck. I mean, when I look back at the last 10 years, I, I spent a lot of time on modeling um, matter particles and lilac particles, really what are photons, what are neutrinos, what are electrons, what are protons. And so very little time was left to sort of, well, how do they interact then together, especially um, when you then combine it a little bit with, you know, good analysis of, uh, you know, the stuff that happens in these high energy uh, situations you know uh, things smashing into each other with much higher energy than you have in uh, normal low energy physics um the last thing i'm gonna do is and i find it interesting i see a lot of nonsense and interest uh, well a lot of interest in what is dark matter really dark matter energy my hypothesis is that we might have a right-handed you know, electromagnetic force, the curiosity, and I, I quote Orkham's razor principle, is that um, the electromagnetic force, um, the electro uh, electric field vector and the magnetic field, you cannot disassociate them. They are related through these um, uh, vector differential operators or differential op scalar differential operators. Uh, so they're two parts of the same coin. Uh, what is remarkable, though, is that the magnetic force is, uh, you know, it follows the electric field vector uh, with, um, it follows it with a phase difference of minus uh, 90 degrees, depending on, you know, a correct choice of your uh, coordinates. Uh, and so um, we see that minus sign there. Um, we also see it here. Uh, the uh, if if that would be a plus, um, we would have an electromagnetic force. I said for for me there is no nuclear force. There's no nuclear charge. That's also why you know weak and strong forces. You know I'm on. If you have a force, you need to show me the charge. An electromagnetic force acts on an electric charge. There is no magnetic charge, and so for me, there's also no nuclear charge. There is no. There is only electric charge. Uh, and so, but what we could have is some kind of right, this is a left-handed, uh, what we see in nature in our matter world, and with matter I include antimatter, uh, positrons and um, um, antiprotons, uh, they do respect, uh, you know, the Maxwell's equations, they behave like it, the magnetic moment they generate, uh, it's all according to these uh, laws, where I think maybe in some other universe, which we seem to observe, um, you know, we have a right-handed electromagnetic force, and that would explain what dark energy, dark matter, you know, these um, dark photons or dark neutrinos, the, 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 the counterpart light particles of the dark matter particles, um, you know, if they um, have a different handshake, so to speak, uh, then, uh, yeah, they, they would shake hands with, uh, with our protons and photons, uh, or electrons, so we wouldn't be able to absorb or have interactions between them. This is a very speculative uh, hypothesis, uh, but it's a very simple one, and I'm kind of proud of it, um, because um, it would make, um, that's why I, I, I do think a bit of my theory as a grand unified theory, uh, I don't cover gravitation, but you know that's because I, I believe Einstein's intuition that gravitation has to do with the non-Cartesian structure of the universe. Makes sense enough for me. Uh, gravitation does not need an explanation. It's a geometric um, fetcher, um, but it's another discussion. So I think apart from that, when in, when when I don't want to look into gravitation, uh, you know, Occam's razor principle, which says that. Um, you know, all mathematical possibilities must correspond to uh, physical uh, possibilities, and all mathematical possibilities then you mean in the simplest of simplest of models, which for me is, uh, you know, yeah, Maxwell's equations combined with um, uh, the two, uh, the Planck Einstein relation, uh, uh, the quantization. Uh, of energy and momentum, linear or angular, uh, and the uh, mass energy uh, equivalence relationship, which I said basically anchors uh, 
uh, a Mars without Mars interpretation uh, and really tells us, you know, Mars is not an essential, is the inertia, uh, Mars is the inertia of, um, to a, a change in the state of motion of charge. And, uh, and fields have an energy also, or carry energy, and so that's why they have also an inertia. Um, but that's sort of what um, I think is complete, uh, except for, um, you know, yeah, possibility, if you see these equations, um, the only degree of freedom I would have to change these equations is, um, is put a plus here. Of course, you will say then um, we would have a minus here. Uh, this, uh, that's correct. Um, and maybe some other things would change um, in this set of equations. But uh, it's clear we have like um, a virtual counterpart, I would say, a mathematical counterpart to Maxwell's equations, which would model uh, a left, a right-handed instead of a, a, the, the left-handed electromagnetic force that we um, that we know, and that would be very beautiful, and it would wonderfully explain, um, you know. Um, yeah, dark matter and energy, which we know is there because um, it has an equivalent mass, um, and it's through the behavior uh, of uh, you know galaxies. Uh, I mean, I'm not a specialist in these things, but there must be a lot of uh, mass around there um, that we can't observe and energy uh, with an equivalent mass, and uh, that must be there because um, the observations of how gravitation works there. Uh, and how galaxies and planets move in certain areas of, uh, of space. Uh, it's not explained by the matter and energy that we can observe, so there must be dark matter and energy out there. And the only, um, why don't we capture any radiation from it? That would make sense if, um, yeah, it's governed by a right-handed electromagnetic force. This is the most speculative, and uh, I haven't seen it uh, anywhere else. Um... Um, I see it, but I see papers like, oh, these are cold gravitons um, or uh, wimps or, you know, other exotic particles. Um, you know, if we can't observe uh, it now because it, it doesn't interact with our uh, matter-antimatter world or ordinary matter, uh, it includes antimatter, um, same structures of particles but with an opposite charge then uh, you know we will never be able also to prove these are wimps or whatever we want to think of them just assuming they um, they obey a different electromagnetic uh, force law um, would explain why we can't observe them and would also explain um, why it is there and um, and that's going to be it um, I've been rambling a little bit, uh, and I'm sorry for that, but it's nice to have a backup video. Um, if I get more questions on my papers, or people say, well, can you look at that? What's your vision on that? Um, and what have you solved? What, what didn't you solve? And especially, I'm happy I answered the question, you know, the easy criticism that is that that mainstream theorists have on these um, Tsitipuig interpretation of, uh, of quantum physics. I think uh, this lecture I showed why such criticism is not valid um, and why, you know, these eternal references to, you know, uh, these classical laws of radiation, uh, why they don't apply to electrons, protons, and atoms as, um, you know, uh, looked at as systems, um, ring currents. Uh, or um, combinations of ring currents. And, uh, and yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you for um, your attention. And uh, let me see. This is it. I've talked for more than an hour, but it went by quickly for me. I hope it went by quickly for you. And again, I'll, um, I'll maybe see you around. Bye.